Hi, hi everyone, and welcome to the Reflections on Art podcast. My name is Chiara Gomizelli. I'm an Italian painter, and today I will be hosting this episode. And with me, I have um, the Australian artist and editor of this podcast, Melissa Corbett, and the Ukrainian American painter, Tatiana Ostapenko, to discuss the lives of the artists. So in the twilight days of the Italian Renaissance, Vasari wrote The Lives of the Artist. And this is an account of lives and times of some of the Western, uh, Euro the, some of the Western Europe most legendary artists. And from this period, many stereotypes and myths associated with the art and the lives of the artists come from. So we will be discussing some of the most well-known art world stereotypes and the artists that we think most closely associate with those tropes and some of the artists who have defied those stereotypes. And we decided to get started with uh, probably one of the most common one, that is the mentally ill artist. Uh, so first I would like to ask Melissa, where do you think the mentally ill artist uh, stereotype comes from? Okay, thank you Tatiana for that beautiful introduction. <laughs> to be honest, I think this idea of the mentally ill artist came about the same time as modern psychiatry did in the 19th century. There were, of course, artists before this period who suffered from mental illnesses, but I think it was only when the works of Freud and other psychoanalysts became popular in the public consciousness that the stereotype associating artists with mental illness really took off. Okay, thank you. And uh, for the first artist we want to talk about, uh, uh, the example comes at mind very easily and it's Vincent van Gogh. Mm -hmm. He's probably one of the most examples, uh, most famous example of this stereotype. And Melissa, can you tell something about van Gogh's life and his work? Absolutely. So obviously Van Gogh is a huge figure of modern art and someone whose art, even people who don't really know anything about art, they know Van Gogh's paintings. His paintings are on everything from couch cushions to towels and blankets, everything. So his art's very hard to escape. Uh, but he was not famous during his lifetime. He was born in 1853 in the Netherlands and started drawing during his teens. He worked as an art dealer in his early adult years and later became a missionary in Belgium. Uh, during the end of this period of his life, he became severely depressed and he started formally painting in 1881 to cope with his depression that he was experiencing in his late 20s. During the last decade of his life, he was extremely productive and created some 2,000 works of art. And during this time of his life, he moved to France in an attempt to improve his mental health and this is where his most famous paintings were created as everyone knows van gogh died tragically young at the age of 37 in 1890 after shooting himself thank you and as you mentioned uh, the the death of van gogh is very controversial in a way and do you think uh, that uh, being the, the, his death such a big part of his, his mythology, together almost as much as his life, Ma, I would like to think uh, to have your opinion about, do you think a tragic death is, ne is a necessary end for an artist's life within this category of the mentally ill artist? No, I absolutely don't think it's... Uh necessary as part of an artist's mythology if they're mentally ill or even that common I mean there are many people who have mental illnesses and most of them die of natural causes like everyone else I've got a lot of family members who 
have had lifelong struggles with mental health. And as far as I'm aware, only one of them's ever attempted suicide. So I don't think it's a necessary part of it. Uh, and then, of course, there's movements such as Art Brut, which arised in the middle of the 20th century. It's also known as outsider art. And that was championed by Jean Dubuffet. And he was very uh, keen on popularising the work of artists in particular who lived in mental institutions or did not fit into the regular categories of modern art. And Art Brat or Outsider Art continues to be an influential stream of modern art with many exhibitions dedicated to this movement happening in various contemporary art museums worldwide to this day. There's actually a specific museum dedicated to this form of art in Portugal. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, in Western culture and in Western medicine, there is a lot of, to, to be understood still in the mental, about the, the mental illnesses. And uh, getting back to art, uh, about talking about uh, contemporary art, I would like to, um, there is an artist who has been very busy creating impressive artworks for a global audience from within uh, asylum, a mental asylum in Japan. And I want to ask uh, Tatiana about the early career of uh, Yayoi Kusama. So Yayoi Kusama is a Japanese artist and she has been enormously prolific. And as you've already mentioned, she is currently residing in a mental institution in Japan. And early on, she was born in a family that was troubled in many ways and her mental illness manifested also very at a very young age she was only 10 years old when she started seeing vivid hallucinations and bright spots of flashes of color and light and um, she started creating artwork that will later on turn into her very distinct and recognizable style of polka dots that just cover so many surfaces. And she used it even at that young age as a coping mechanism to just cover the world and cover the things that were disturbing her in the world. Her mother was extremely abusive and her father was a womanizer. So as a young child, her mother would make her spy on her dad. So she was witnessing her father cheating on her mother and it, added to her and she speaks about this very freely so it added a lot and influenced her themes in her artwork that often through the years dealt with sexuality and sex from that early trauma her parents were not very supportive of her artwork especially her mother and she studied early on in the Kyoto art schools of arts and crafts and she studied a traditional Japanese style of painting However, early on, she found it quite limiting and she was looking up to the Americans, the abstract expressionism movement for its freedom. And she moved to New York City and became a very active participant in the avant-garde art scene there. Okay, that's, uh, that's a very interesting uh, overview on uh, her uh, early years but what do you think she felt the need to to move from new york where she was having this career uh to go back to japan and admit uh, admit herself into into a mental institution so while in new york city Kusama was extremely prolific and created a variety of artwork from painting to installation to a lot of happenings that were quite controversial and well noticed. And despite the fact that she was an influential member of the art scene and was friends with the likes of Eva Hess and Donald Judd, she was never, her work was never commercially 
viable. And a lot of times the themes of her artwork and the ideas were taken then by the male artists in the New York art scene and they ran with it and they did very well and were recognized for it. So she had a lot of financial problems and also at that time in New York, she does attempt to commit suicide and moves to Japan prior to committing herself to the mental institution she does attempt a career as an art dealer in Japan for a few years that does not quite work out for her and then she voluntarily commits herself to a mental institution where she continues to reside and make work mm -hmm. Okay, and do you think it uh, this uh, this situation, this um, being in this mental institution, have uh, has hindered or helped her career throughout the years? I think that her entire life story and the story of her, not so much career, but her making, she's so single hand, single focused on her art, and as she uses it as a coping mechanism for working with her mental illness. Um, there is a quote that I saw somewhere, I'm going to paraphrase, so I'm not gonna tell you where the quote is from, but this knowing that one has very little control over this mental health condition, then in her artwork, Kusama creates these immersive installations that almost overpower the senses. There are mirrored rooms that are covered in this. There's just so much texture. There's so much intensity. So she takes you into this world that is very similar to her visions by con totally controlling the environment for her viewers in a way that she has very little way of controlling her own mental health experience. So while I don't know how much being a recluse in the mental institution has influenced her career directly. We also have to think about the stereotype that Melissa has discussed earlier and that there is a quality of novelty. And while her work is amazing and she's prolific and so talented, I can also see how the exoticism and the novelty of an artist working from a mental institution could become very appealing in terms of presenting her work by the institutions, by the curators. There's a, narr there's a very interesting and unusual narrative that could definitely further the career of an artist, I think. Thank you. Yeah, I think you, you capture a very important point and um... I believe it's also something interesting in general how art can be of help for everyone. Of course, no one, not everybody can become famous, but I think art has this power also to to capture and uh, make it through art. We can we can see our world and show our world and deal with what happened to us. So I think this is a very important point about this category of artists and of uh, art in general for for everyone. Okay, so let's get to the second part of, uh, of this, oh, the second stereotype that we have chosen, which is the torture soul artist. And those particular artists are those who are uh, after the unreachable sublime. And uh, it is a trope that uh, um, mostly, com uh, mostly comes from the literary and intellectual movement of the late 18th uh, and early 19th century. Yeah, thank you for that introduction, Kiara. I definitely think uh, there's a huge influence from Romanticism in the whole mythology of the tortured soul artist. And I think it's good to point out what is the difference between an artist who may have a mental illness and an artist who is identified as a tortured soul artist because there seems to be a bit of overlap between the two. Uh, the artists that we're going to talk about, Edvard Munch and 
uh, Tracy Emmons certainly have had their uh, emotional and mental health struggles, but I think it's a little bit different in that uh, any kind of mental health issues are not like the primary focus of this artist's life or work within this stereotype. It's more about external tragedies coming in and invading the space of a tortured artist to the point where they are not coping with reality anymore but also uh, producing incredible artworks that are channeling these kind of intense emotions which I think is a beautiful lead into Edvard Munch, who created some of the most emotionally intense paintings of the 19th and early 20th century. Thank you, Melissa, for this introduction to, to Edvard Munch and his torture soul. And I would like to, Tatiana to, to talk about this, uh, um, about his work and his, uh, his life and why, why he is in this category. I am personally a really big fan of Edward Munch's art. Um, and it's very interesting. He is definitely most well known for his painting. It's called Scream. And it's one of the most recognizable images of art, Western artwork in the world. Talk about mugs and cups and posters and everywhere and uh, countless memes that have sprung from that image and while we can kind of dismiss it for becoming you know a pop culture almost invisible in its popularity image there's a i think there's a reason why it continues to be so compelling it is known to be as a reflection of the modern humanity's anxiety and angst and i would imagine everybody who's listening knows what the painting looks like. It's a stylized figure seen kind of from a point of view that would have to be either someone hovering above and in front of viewing the figure and it's in this burning landscape sunset with again very stylized rough marks and the figure is screaming. And um, just a little bit about Edward Munch and his background so that we can then tie back into this, again, very well-known painting and give some understanding of the man who would create an image like that. He was born in a family of an extremely religiously zealous father. And from early on, from very young in life, he was completely nerve-wracked and terrified of mental illness himself because mental illness ran in the family his younger sisters had mental health problems very early on and in his own words he said that i inherited two of the mankind's most frightful enemies the heritage of consumption and insanity and at the time when he is living and working Tuberculosis is definitely one of the biggest killers and one of the most terrifying things. So this man goes through life holding on to an intense sense of dread for his health, both physical and mental. His family, same way as other artists that we're talking about here, his family was not supportive of his art endeavors. Again, very conservative, very religiously zealot kind of a father. And young, young Edward Munch gets connected to the Bohemian circles when he goes to the university and he studies art. He's not supported by his family. And there is a lot of influence from his circle at the time that his friends and colleagues encourage him to move away from just exploring painting with a you know, post-impressionist and impressionist style, but to paint more his internal 
psychological states. So he starts writing a diary of his soul, and then he paints paintings that are focused primarily on communicating rather than depicting these internal states and emotions. And um, I would absolutely love to read you another quote of his. So the scream is a painting that's made later on in his career and throughout his entire time he was really struggling with he was drinking heavily and he was having hallucinations that we don't know right now if it was induced by an actual mental illness or just he was drinking that much but he was drinking and brawling his lifestyle was again against what his family's wishes would have been so the quote the very famous quote about again the very famous painting is as follows. I was walking down the road with two friends when the sun set. Suddenly, the sky turned as red as blood. I stopped and leaned against the fence, feeling unspeakably tired. Tongues of fire and blood stretched over the bluish black fjord. My friends went on walking, while I lagged behind, shivering with fear. Then I heard the enormous, infinite scream of nature. So that is the experience that he then continuously paints and draws and creates the scream. Thank you, thank you, Tatiana. And uh, I think uh, Munch is really an interesting example of the torture artist, especially when you look at his life. And we want to go back to the 19th century and Melissa, uh, you mentioned Tracy Amin and what can you, can, what can you tell us about uh, this, this contemporary artist and how uh, is she associated with uh, this stereotype? Okay, thank you Chiara. So Tracy Amin is a contemporary British artist. Uh, she was born in England in 1963 and she did a master's in painting in the late 80s, but she destroyed all of her early paintings. So in my research for this uh, series of podcasts that we're doing about artist stereotypes, I actually re-watched uh, This Is Modern Art. Um, a television show that was filmed in the late 90s by the art critic Matthew Collings. And in episode two of this series, uh, they actually parallel Tracy Emin with Edvard Munch. They even go to Norway to visit the Munch Museum together. And so I thought it's a very interesting comparison and I thought we would continue this comparison in the podcast. And I think the reason for this comparison is that Emin channels all of her feelings about her life into her art. Those darker feelings and stories uh, from her life, which includes sexual assault and abortion. So putting those personal tragedies of her life into artworks that are very emotionally impactful for the audience. Uh, she rose to fame in the 90s along with the other young British artists such as Damien Hirst, Sarah Lucas and uh, in her work she would often display artifacts from her personal life uh, such as I think one of the works that she displayed was a pack of cigarettes from her uncle at the time of his death when he died, at a car, died in a car accident. Another one of her works, probably her most famous slash infamous work called Everyone I Have Ever Slept With, 1963 to 1995. It's a tent which is embroidered with the names of everyone Tracy Emin has had, had had sex with up to that date. So she definitely uses it as a personal diary, 
but it was really interesting watching that episode uh, shock horror uh, in This Is Modern Art because during the interview she herself said that if she could uh, be emotionally stable, she would trade being a famous artist for that stability. And she also said that the only way that she manages to cope with her life and her emotions is through her art. Thank you, Melissa. This is another great example. And I have a question for the both of you. And I would like to you to tell me what you think about um, if this stereotype of the tortured artist has still uh, a validity in nowadays in the art world. Yeah, I think that art as a therapeutic release valve has a place in contemporary art. I think the work of Emin in particular is important because it reveals a lot of the pain that women have had to deal with privately for so long. And through her channeling that personal pain through her art, she removes the shame that she's experienced in her personal tragedies. So I think, yeah, it's definitely important that art reflects some of the darker feelings and experiences that we have in life. But I don't think the stereotype itself is useful. I think it's possible to make art and mostly be happy. It's certainly something that I try to work towards uh, in my life and in my internal state of being. But I'd be interested to hear what you think, Tatiana. I love actually what you've said. And I think the only thing I can do is really restate it. I detest the stereotype of having to be tortured in order to produce good art. However, I also am very grateful for the artists who came before us, who paved the way for normalizing art using personal experience and taking shame out of disclosure of very intimate life detail if that is something that is important for the artist to do. So for me personally and my work, I am still trying to find the balance between over disclosure of very personal and biographical details in my work and deciding where that comfort is, the comfort level. But as Melissa just said, I also strive for good mental health. And being well, while still making relevant contemporary artwork, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa and Tatiana. I think it's really good to conclude this, uh, this episode on this positive note, because um, the torture, sometimes we feel that as an artist, we have to communicate something, uh, of course, from our soul, but uh, take it from the negative or take it from... Uh, uh, the pain, but it's also, I think, very, very important to to communicate whatever goes through the an artist's soul. So it's very good. I'm very glad to conclude on this positive note. So next month we will continue exploring the lives of artists, and we will explore the myth versus the reality and the past versus the present. So make sure to stay tuned and you can follow uh, the Reflection Art Podcast that can be found on Anchor FM forward slash Reflection on Art and or you can hit the notification bell on your YouTube channel uh, that is again Reflection on Art. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you Tatiana. Thank you Melissa for being here and we hope you have a great day, night or wherever time of the day is in your place. <laughs> <laughs>